for Bill, Mr. William uh, Picard, uh, a fantastic business owner for our uh, Arthur Talk Fireside Chat. Um, this is going to be a very informal conversation. We want to make sure we get some questions from you all. I know I have some questions from uh, reading the book myself, but we really want to make sure everyone feels comfortable, have a chance to ask some questions, and get some good information from our uh, conversation tonight. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do quick, basic read of the bio, make sure we get the formal part out, out of the way. But then what we want to do is kind of go around the room real quick and get uh, just a quick your name and a little bit about what you do. Nothing too long, just a little bit about what you do. Okay. All right. Um, so William F. Picard is chairman of and founder of GAA Manufacturing Supply Chain Management, GAA New Ventures, co-managing partner of MGM Grand uh, Detroit Casino, CEO of Beerwood Management McDonald's, and co-owner of five black-owned newspapers. That's a lot of stuff. Okay. I kind of ran through it pretty quickly, but there's a lot of stuff there. Um, Picard's 47-year entrepreneurial career began as a McDonald's franchise. Franchisee in Detroit, Michigan. Since its founding in 1989, GAA has generated more than $5 billion in sales with eight plants in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and service corporations such as Boeing, Mercedes Benz, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, Delphi, Johnson Controls, Starbucks, Home Depot, and Merck Pharmaceutical. He has served on numerous business and nonprofit boards, including Asset Acceptance Capital Corporation. Michigan National Bank, LaSalle Bank, Business Leaders of Michigan, National Urban League, Detroit Symphony Orchestra. My daughter will love that. She's a violinist. So oh, she'll actually love that. You, you ever heard of Sphinx? You ever heard of Sphinx? Mm -hmm. you got to, Sphinx is a black organization founded by a brother, and they do nothing but strings. Really? And they okay. are global. I get your stuff. Okay, yeah. Should I yeah, it up? Yeah, yeah. They are, they are awesome. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, uh, Detroit Black Chamber of Commerce and is a life member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity. Oh, see? I saw up there. Yeah, all right. Everything. We might get a step in here, right? Young bro, step. In 2001, Picard was awarded Michiganian of the Year for his business success, civic leadership, and philanthropy. Card was the first chairman of the African Development Foundation in 1982, appointed, to pre appointed by President Ronald Reagan and, and under George and under President George Bush, he was appointed to the National Advisory Committee on Trade Policy Negotiations, um, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board uh, in, in Indianapolis, Indianapolis Bank in Indiana. Uh, Dr. Picard is also creating a new generation of entrepreneurs with millionaire moves, seven proven principles of, of entrepreneurship. Vision, attitude, opportunity, relationships, talent, skill set, financial failure, and uh, failure and faith. Dr. Bakar will share his undeniable principles. Anyone can use this uh, and use them to become a successful entrepreneur. So that's a lot of information. But I think what we really need to take from it is that um, the reason why we're here is because we're going to get a chance to talk to someone who has been successful and has done what we're all looking to do. So I think this is what this uh, final touch chat is all about. So um, what I want to do is kind of start from the front and kind of weave its way back. Just again, uh, your name and just a little bit about what you do. Hi there. My name is Toya Evans. Uh, I'm a recovering technologist, as I like to call myself, but I'm in business for myself now with my daughters. We have a couple franchises. And, um, okay. uh, Tropical Smoothie Cafe. Oh, oh my God. And, um, we are about to open a hand and stone massage and facial. Get out of here, girl. Trying cool. to get into hotels of choice. So that's all the three franchises that we're working with right now. God bless you. My first deal was McDonald's. I still have some McDonald's today. <laughs> so I cooked hamburgers. God. God bless you. She's so yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> up all that stuff. Yeah. Get it together. Good. But it's great serving the community. Good evening, everyone. My name is Angela Barnes. I'm a budget analyst with the federal government, and I am a new business owner, Kimada Holistic Health and, and Wellness. Mm -hmm. So I came mm -hmm. out to hear you you speak and to get this book to help me on my my journey with starting this, this new business. God bless you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Taylor Bland. I'm a special ed teacher at uh, Apple Tree uh, Public Charter School, 
And um, I'm just starting out. I just graduated Johns Hopkins. So um, I am trying to be inspired and learn from the best. All right, what congratulations. Was, what city did you grow up in? Detroit. All right. Detroit versus everybody. I love it. Hello, my name is George. Um, I'm an up and coming producing director, uh, doing film in the city. So, um, I'm, I'm, yep. <laughs> Bless you, man. That's, that's, that's you better even go talk to Tyler Perry. Hey, I'm on my way there. Is that a beautiful example? Yes. yes awesome. Definitely. How y'all doing, everybody? Hello. My name is Marcus Black. Um, I am uh, up and coming artist manager. My company is named 415 Management. It's uh, named after my mom's birthday. So, uh, yes. And I'm also uh, getting ready to get into real estate as well. Mm -hmm. So, just Beautiful. a couple things that I'm working on. Beautiful. All right. My name is Tracy Woods. I uh, came out to see my good brother. Mm -hmm. um, God bless you. I played at the Alpha Chapter. So, uh, it, it's great being here in, in D.C. And, and being here uh, for this million, Millionaire Moves tonight. Uh, background. I. I've been in the power business for nearly 35 years. Uh, utility, I'm a power engineer by training, so I spent many years in the utilities now doing work in a nonprofit, American Association of Blacks and Energy. So oh, really? what we do is try to advocate, not try, mm -hmm. we advocate for uh, economic and energy policy for communities of color. So it's been great. I've been here oh, in D.C. for the last five years, the organization's 40 plus years old. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about it and want to hear about these millionaire moves. Yes, I'm uh, James Wright. I'm a reporter with the Washington former newspaper, and yes, I am covering this event. And I wanted to meet Brother Picard. Uh, I, too, am an alpha. I met him at the uh, Las Vegas convention, and I just got too excited when I found out he was coming here. In addition to being a reporter, I have my own TV show on DC TV called The OLA. Um, the, the old, I, I forget the name of my own show, but it's the OLA, it's not, the chapter I belong to is OLA, and uh, I am the host and producer of that show on DC TV. Mm. And yeah, that's it. And we hope to get you on there one day. <laughs> I'm Laquita Booth, and I'm FOB, friend of Bill's. <laughs> <laughs> I was dean of the College of Business at Alabama State, and he was my first entrepreneur in residence. He said that he was semi-retired and we were working him too hard because we weren't paying him for three years. Um, so uh, that's when he decided to write a book. And I've been helping him get on college campuses, uh, editing the book. And really excited about the upcoming book that he has in mind. Hopefully he will tell you a little bit about that when he finishes Millionaire Moves. This is, this is a tag. You never know what God has in store for you. Mm. Now, I don't apologize. I made a little money. And mm -hmm. so, um, after my mother passed, you know, I'm an only child. Tall, dark, and handsome, only child. Right? <laughs> so, I kind of checked out a little bit, you know. And I was went to Florida and spent a lot of time there. So, a friend of mine called me and said, Hey, Pig, listen, man, we have this conference at Tuskegee on um, black business. Da, 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 da. I said, Man, it's February. I'm not leaving. I'm not coming up that cold ass <laughs> work, man. You know, it was Tommy Dorch. Brother's president of 100 black men. Okay. So, of course, tell me you don't say no. So I go, and um, I'm up there trying to give a speech, and I say, you know, what I really want to do one day when I grow up, I want to go to a black college and teach entrepreneurship. Because my degree is in social work. My bachelor's, master's, PhD is social work. People, how would you go from social work to this, you know? Yeah, right. And so, um, so I get there, and I make that statement, and I'm just rolling, you know how we get up. So when I finished, she said, are you ready to go to Montgomery? I said, Montgomery? I ain't never been to Montgomery, girl. She said, well, I'm the dean of the School of Business at Alabama State. You said you want to do it. I'm going to take you. <laughs> Six months later, I'm at Alabama State teaching for a dollar a year. I was going to stay one year, and I stayed three years, and it changed my life. Because I had never gone to a black school. I went to Michigan and Ohio State and what my granddaddy called Law and University College. I went to a community college. <laughs> you know? So I, 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 I tell everybody that if nothing else, my life is an example of what can be done when you're not terribly bright and you made some mistakes early in life. And if you put the work in, God will help you get where you want to go. Amen. So Dean Booth is my, uh, my 
<laughs> the alter ego, she's my boss, and she's on this journey with us, and we have a little fun. I think we're doing a little good. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mark Collins. I'm an HR specialist for the federal government. I don't know what I'll be down the line, but I do want to learn from uh, you know somebody who's done some different things, and so I hope to you know enjoy the talk with Mark and you and other people around. Good. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Dennis Sawyer. I went to Howard University for electrical engineering, but now I teach financial literacy. I've been doing that for about nine years. Good. Um, my own business. Good. God bless you. Well, the reason we're in town, we'll talk more about it. We're going to be in Howard all day tomorrow, mm -hmm. and we have this new book coming out, and we're trying to teach a class at Howard about the new book. We'll tell you about it. And uh, Dean Booth knows all these big Negroes, you know. I don't know them, but she <laughs> told them what we're going to do. So it's been fun. Yes, sir. Brother came in. Was that uh, Omega Sci-Fi? Yes, sir. To the day I die. God bless you. Come on, brother. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terrence Hobson. I actually work at Howard in the IT department. Uh, I just finished writing a book called The Heartbreak of a Black Man. It just got released today. Congratulations. Congratulations. Hey. You got a free hey. copy? Come on now. <laughs> now the copy, the hard copy is not coming until Friday. Okay. It is available on Amazon now. I'll give you my phone number, my zip phone, everything. Oh, no, for sure. You guys have a free copy. Congratulations. No, 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 we paid. <laughs> that was the time I couldn't, but now either, I can. Either or, just, yeah. uh, the reason I wrote was just more to get the word out there than for monetary purposes. So. Oh, good. God bless you. Know, you. If I get it for free, it doesn't really matter. God bless you. you. Does. Make it like no. It really does matter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the other day I was somewhere and the lady said to me, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to give, I need 10 books to sell to some kids. I said, well, wait, wait a minute. I said, I'm not going to give kids 10 books, but I tell you what I'll do, I'll give them $3. And she said, well, why don't you give them to them? I said, listen, honey, if you don't place value on mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. Our community would just suck it up and forget about it. Right. But mm -hmm. if you give up $3, that tells me one thing. At least you have an interest in what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, bro, man, I, I respect the fact that you're not doing it for the money. But but have us buy into the bid. Awesome. Have us put some sweat echo into the deal. Now, sometimes it ain't money. You know, it's just working and, and contributing, especially the brothers and artists. You know, I, who wouldn't follow Terry, Tyler Perry around for a year free? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You know? Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't do that? So I commend you because it takes discipline to write a book, and I commend you for that. Thank okay, you. who's next? Yes, sir. My name is Anthony Farrell. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm a retired electrician. I got a couple of businesses that I'm not doing well in right now, so I'm looking for pointers. Uh, but that's what I'm doing right now. I've also been Learning to fly an airplane lately. Oh, God bless you. God bless you. God has blessed me with some interesting experiences. I recommend that you do some of the things that might be a little scary. It opens up a whole new feeling about life. So that's what I'm doing and looking to learn. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. My name is Candace Brooks. I'm a physical therapist, but I'm trying to branch out into like the wellness industry. <laughs> <laughs> See what God does? Yeah. And one of the points of entrepreneurship is relationship. Mm -hmm. Relationship. Mm -hmm. and people say, well, I don't, I'm not no brown noser. I'm not going to network. <laughs> well, sometimes if you don't network, you might not work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to hook up. Right. Absolutely. Y'all got to talk. Yes, we sure do. <laughs> I know you're in charge of everything, but I am in charge of everything. My name is Trevor. I work at Mahogany Brooks, and uh, I have my own business. But I'm just gonna leave it for y'all. I'm working on my baby, but good. Yeah, so I'm I'm really blessed to be here. Thanks for coming to speak. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, um, I. Realize I didn't introduce myself. My name is Derek Young. I'm one of the owners here at Mahogany Books, along with my wife and my daughter, 14 year old uh, freshman daughter in high school. Nice. Um, uh, we're just excited to to really create Mahogany Books for moments like this. Thank this you. is what our vision was from the very beginning, 12 years ago, um, to be able to create a space where people come out to and engage in conversations, read books that empowers them to move forward and accomplish their goals and dreams. So this is exactly what the entire point of Mahogany Books is. So 
I'm excited. I'm gonna get we're gonna get started here. Um, and again, as I said, this is gonna be a casual conversation. I'll we'll probably lead off with two questions, mm-hmm. allow Brother Bill to speak, and but then make sure we have a chance for everyone to kind of um, ask questions as well. Okay. So I know the, the two things that as I was reading, the ones that stuck out to me, um, mm-hmm. that it took me a while to understand um, as I was growing up and maturing. But the first thing you talk about is, um, well, I'm going to reverse it, uh, is uh, what I call PMA, positive mental attitude. Mm-hmm. I know that was pretty much your first principle, vision and attitude. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Could you talk about that? Because in my mind, without that, you really Zero. don't. Right. Zero. Right. You won't get off the front porch. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it sounds like pop psychology. And I, I tell you again, I went to school to be a social worker. I was an excellent social worker, still am to a degree. But this thing about attitude and vision is is, is is easy to talk about, but it's hard to explain. But the Bible says it very early on. Without vision, the people will care. <laughs> you know, uh, Madam C.J. Walker says a little different. She said, "I got my start by giving myself a start." You know, and in our community, you know, we are very good at certain things. Uh, we, if we decide we got to be a great basketball player, some of these brothers and sisters go out and they put in 18 hours a day, and they do it. But when it comes to business, sometimes we think it's magic. We think that it's going to be a magical moment that it's all going to come together. But I call and I see people and say, hey, man, it's an overnight success. He said, yeah, 22 years, you know. <laughs> right. Same with musicians, you know. Uh, I, I love music. And uh, I'm always in, like Kim. I love, Kim is from Detroit. I love his stuff. And so one night I'm on a flight with Kim, and we just kicking it, you know. And I said, man, I said, I know I shouldn't ask you this, but I got to ask you, man. I know you had some rough things here, man. I started a band in high school. And one of the girls that I fell in love with was in the band. And she wound up with another brother in the band, and I couldn't handle it. I started drinking. He said, I stayed on the streets for six years, night and day, day and night. And in Detroit, there's a river. And I don't know what his birthday is, but in the homeless thing in Detroit, you have so many nights in a shelter, then you have to leave, and another brother has so many nights. He said, so on the night of my birthday, the eve of my birthday, I didn't have a bed. He said, I went down to the Detroit River, and I uh, slept behind the Detroit Free Press. It's a newspaper building. He said, and that morning I woke up, and I went back to the, uh, to the shelter, and they said, man, you should have come in last night. The guy supposed to get your bed didn't show up. He said, no, man, I'm good. He said, um, I had a talk with Jesus last night. Gosh, you're right. right. You know, he said, I'm good. He said, this is my birthday, but this is also my new birthday. And Kim said, from that day on, he been straight. Now, how do you explain that? He was a gifted musician. This boy was, you know, he's very creative. He does his writing, producing, play, he does everything. But yet one incident, sent him off the deep edge, struggled with it for six years, and the toilet gets cold in the wintertime. But God said, no, no, I'm going to take care of you. But on that night, down on the Detroit River, he said, his grandmother just told him, son, you're better than this. Get up and turn it around. He went back to the shelter. He said, I never had another drink. And what he does in Detroit every year, where that shelter is located, he gives a free concert every year. Uh And brother and sister come from everywhere. (laughs) And so it's hard to talk about this vision thing. But I can tell you one thing. Um, I went to school to be a social worker, and uh, I always, I always visualized that I was going to be successful at something. And 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 I grew up in a little town called Flint, Michigan. Yeah. And my granddaddy had a very stern way of running the family, whether his his sons and daughters or his grandchildren. Everybody had a job. He called it two arm living. Mm-hmm. So if you were in if you worked in the General Motors plant, and let's say you were an electrician, then on the side, hustle, you were doing something with electricity. Mm-hmm. 
you was preparing somebody's house, you was working at a church on the side. So I always grew up with this hustle mentality. But I thought I would um, become a social worker and maybe have a barbecue joint on the side, or maybe I would have a little promotion business on the side. And, and then God stepped in, and the whole world changed. It wasn't me, I must have said. It was just an opportunity was presented to me in McDonald's. I mean, I was 28 years of age going to Ohio State to get a doctor. I'm working at McDonald's on the campus. And a guy come up to me and say, hey, man, we hear you're from Detroit. Yeah. He said, we're going to put some blacks in Detroit in McDonald's. You know anybody? Sure. I gave him three fraternity brothers' names. And none of us had money. I'm in school. How am I have money? I go to the uh, financial aid office. I meet a black man named John Hall. I don't tell. I lied. I must admit I lied. I told him I needed ten thousand dollars because there were three of us and we had to have twenty five thousand dollars. That's eight thousand three hundred thirty three dollars thirty three cents. But I wanted ten, <laughs> and he gave me the loan, and that's how I got in business. So I don't take the example. I ain't got no money. My mama and my daddy didn't get along. My grandmother didn't leave me no money. All of that is just bullshit. Because all of us, all of us have something in us that nobody else in the world has. God didn't make but one you. And you have to resolve unequivocally. What is it that I'm prepared to lay it all in the line for? And I believe that's your attitude about life. And that's your vision about what you want to become. And I know it sounds like pop psychology, man, but I believe that every day of my life, I really do. So let me ask you a question because I, I mean, I 100 percent agree with you, and that it will, will, you have to have some type of goal, right? Mm -hmm. A bigger view of. I um, mean, you put out some really good quotes that I wasn't aware of. That I really um, enjoy. You even had a Jay Z one. Oh, yeah. So I was kind of, I was curious, well, okay, I'm watching the JC, okay, all right, I read, I listen to music. <laughs> but, uh, so what the question is, always comes down to, well, for people who have done it, it's easy to get there, right? How do you explain to someone who's in that process of trying to figure out how to, how to actually materialize that vision, identify what it is, what is that process? Well... Let's go to Jay-Z first. Okay. Uh, Mr. Carter was in the projects in Brooklyn. I think he was 19. Here's what this brother man wrote at 19 years of age. Your vision must be greater than the window you're looking through. Now, for those of us who grew up in projects, you know, to, the windows are like this. They're window panes. And this young brother sitting there saying, hey, I'm looking through this window. But my vision is much greater than this window. And so I would argue no matter how big the window is, your vision should be greater. Mm -hmm. 19 years old. Mm -hmm. Now, I couldn't put it in that language, but I think I understand the concept. Mm -hmm. That where, wherever you are in life, you've got to just visualize what you want to actualize. Mm -hmm. And again, it sounds like pop psychology, but I believe in it every day of my life. Now, the second, what was the second question? How do you develop that yeah. vision? And I think it starts with very, and I hate to go here, you know. No, but if a brother sees an impressive sister, you know, uh, he going to shoot. If he's from Detroit, you know, he's going to blow. And yet, he's always going to be a gentleman. He's always going to be respectful. But if it doesn't work out, he ain't going to just give up. He's going to find another way. Another time to be at the next event, networking, head up, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just believe you just stay at it. I tell people all the time, most failure is guaranteed if you don't try. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't take that shot, you ain't got to worry about making it. <laughs> you got to take it. Mm -hmm. And I think in life, you know, we, we uh, here's my quote. If at first you don't succeed, you're about average. <laughs> most people don't get this overnight success is 20 years 15 years you know uh, like your tropical smoothie I like but just think for a moment the sister says she and her daughters are thinking about a tropical smoothie but if she had said to me what's your name again? Toya if Toya had said to me my daughters are now working on Toya smoothie 
Now, I would have been positive because I ain't going to never be negative. Mm -hmm. But if we had a sidebar, I'd say, Tommy, listen, why don't you check out Tropical? Because they got a format, they got a system, they got advertising, they got a brand. Some things are a little easier. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some people who have gone into business and didn't have none of that. But if you got some of that and you can make it work for you, like bookstores. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Barnes & Nobles is like Model T Ford now. Mm -hmm. This is what's going on in the world of books. This is it. But how do you put this on steroids to maximize it? Because you have a vision here of a community and the people who look like us that you want to serve. And that takes some creativity. You know, that takes some doing. Example, there's a franchise out, which I don't understand, but I like it, where the ladies get together, men too, I guess, and they paint and drink drink wine. <laughs> Is that called silk? Silk. They paint silk. Man, that woman be in there, get drunk. Hey, God! <laughs> think about that. And that might be something. No, you got, yeah. you got, to, you got to be creative. <laughs> and our community is so hungry, yeah. in my opinion, for things that that extend our boundaries. Like the brother talk about flying. I ain't ready for that. <laughs> but 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 there are some things that we know we just do. And you, and when you can plug into that. Your books will walk out of here mm -hmm. with people buying them and families coming. What would happen if you had family night? Mm -hmm. What happen if you have Second Baptist Church night? Oh, yeah. You know, what happen mm -hmm. if you have teachers night? You know, mm -hmm. that's the uniqueness of knowing our community and how we market to them. No. 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 I got, it. I got. It. All right, so I'm gonna be greedy. I'm gonna uh, ask one more question. And I'm gonna open it up for everyone else. Okay. <laughs> so the other thing, and, I, and I'm, I'm, um. I have a uh, agenda behind asking this question, um, but I, I really think it's why people are here. You kind of touched on it already, but you talked about in the beginning of your book, um, your motto, each one, reach one, teach one. Can you talk about um, the necessity of that, especially in our community as we have all these expire, aspiring entrepreneurs, beginning entrepreneurs, people who are have these dreams and these goals, um, and, there are, and there are people who are highly successful, how do we go about creating those kind of relationships yeah. to really kind of pull each one up so mm -hmm. that as we're doing something, mm -hmm. you pointed out over here, right? Mm -hmm. How do you do it so we're, we're building the ship mm -hmm. at the same time as we're actually yeah. flying the yeah. ship? You know, both we the same gotta time. repair a 747 while it's in the air. Yeah. Well, the number one major today in most HBCUs is entrepreneurship slash business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. We're hungry. Mm -hmm. We're hungry. Mm -hmm. It ain't basketball. It ain't football. You know. So at least the awareness has finally come. <clears throat> you know. Now, how do you get a brother or sister who has been successful, and that's any level of success? You know. How do you get them to plug in to their church or their fraternity or sorority or the, the HBCU or just people? And that's a challenge because when you're grinding every day, you know, I don't care what nobody say. I heard <laughs> Tyler Perry was on Tom Jordan Monday morning mm -hmm. yesterday. What's today? Yesterday. <laughs> Tom Jordan said, hey, man, how you doing, Tyler? said, I'm going to work. I got to pay my rent this week. <laughs> it never stops. Now, some of us are worse than others, you know. I, I'm, I'm sick. But but the reason I wrote this book was at, Al Dr. Booth Court, at Alabama State, I kept meeting these young brothers and sisters who were hungry for business. And I will never forget when I taught one year at North Carolina Central. I, I get my boys to come into class, you know, once a week. I bring somebody in from Detroit or Atlanta. And at the end of the semester, you know, you get these evaluations, and, and the student says something I didn't understand. And it, it went like this. We have never met successful black people in business before who would come all the way from Chicago or Detroit and spend time with us. Mm -hmm. That baffled me for a few moments. Mm -hmm. But then I tried to unpack it. And if you're central, you might be from a very small little town. And the only black business people you see is a funeral home guy who's hustling and a couple other people who are hustling. So the image that we have sometimes is not always reflective of what we are as a people. 
But there are some things that I think we all can do. And that is, you got to go. You got to go to these BS meetings. You got to go where they're networking. You got to go where we're, we're faking it till we make it, but you got to go. Because, you know, one guy told me at uh, St. Augustine, an old man told me this, his son, you, you make sense. He said, but let me tell you something. If you ain't in the huddle, mm. you don't know the play. Mm. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, so how can I sit home watching another Atlanta housewives and they have the reception out there with the black MBAs or some shit, you know? So you gotta, you gotta be in it. Love it. Yes. You gotta be in it. Yes. And I don't, don't get me wrong, I, I go to church and all that stuff, but most black churches that I know about now have some similar of a business thing to them. Yeah. Now, you know, and don't get me wrong, some people make a lot of money, some people front they ain't making no money. <laughs> but you gotta be in the in the culture. Mm. You gotta know the, the the words and the players and the people. And a lot of folk are faking it. But that's okay. You can see the good and you can see the bad. But you gotta be out here. You gotta come <clears> to <throat> stuff like this. That sister talked about holistic medicine. This sister talking about it the first person spoke. You know, so you got to be out here. You got to be in it. Yeah. And how I met this brother, I was sitting home one Sunday just watching TV. I love C-SPAN. I don't watch Atlanta Housewives. I don't give a damn what nobody says. I, <laughs> I ain't going to watch it. I'm not going to waste my time watching that shit. I'm not going to do it. And I have a 24-year-old daughter. She still watches it. She's crazy, too. You know, there's something you ought not waste your time on. Yeah. You ought to be reading or thinking or scheming or praying or something. But don't be watching that shit. Yes, sir. Black folks on average. Black folks on average. Listen to this now. On average. Mm. Black folks watch 62 hours of television in a week. Oh my wow. 62 hours. What kind of sense that makes? Mm. There's no logic to it, you know. So I'm a firm believer in just being in the mix. Whether you're Kappa or Q, I get less than a darn about that. But you gotta be out here. You gotta be in the community. You gotta be with the people that are trying to get to the next level. And I fully understand that a lot of it is fake. I understand that part, but that's okay. That's okay. Somebody who's faking it is going to make it. And that's who I want to be with. Yeah. And I tell people, especially young people, I tell, look, you tell me who your five best friends are, and I'll tell you where you're going. You know, I'm not, I was not the smartest guy in the world. I'm a social worker. But my five best friends, Harvard lawyer, University of Michigan dentist, um, Stanford finance guy, they're my boys. <laughs> now I got more money than all of them, but that's okay. <laughs> they're my, that's my posse. Yeah, I talk about yeah. those. That's my posse. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to be out here with people who sh have a shared vision about life. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't care if it's two brothers or two sisters or brother and sister. You got to have a shared vision. Ain't no sense of you investing your time in a brother or whatever that has a different vision about his life than yours. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you can't be a little bit. One can like a violin, mm -hmm. and I can like Jay-Z. But you've got to have that something and say, we want to build something together. But I would beg of you, every decision you make, take in consideration that we're already hundreds of years behind white folks mm -hmm. and Asians. Uh -huh. mm. And whatever you do with the little money we have, do something consciously, consciously, to prepare your family for the next generation. Mm -hmm. Example, Tom Jordan again, Monday morning, they talk about Cartier glasses. Mm -hmm. They said the number one market in the world for Cartier eyewear is Paris. Mm -hmm. The number two market in the world is Detroit. Wow. I said, this, I can't believe it. Oh, no. I got in my car. <laughs> I went down to one, a place called Vision Works. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I walk in there. I said, I know y'all think I'm crazy, but tell me about this Cartier uh, eyewear. And one lady was a cop. She said, they kill each other about it. Mm -hmm. We've had murders in Detroit over wow. eyewear. Wow. Robberies. Eyewear? What's, what's wrong with us? Hmm. Now, you can't change everybody, but you start with one person. Yeah. 
my daughter's not going to see me watching Atlanta Housewives. Now, she's going to watch it, but I ain't going to watch it. I'm just not going to do that. And I'm not going to go out and spend $500 for a pair of glasses. I'm just not going to do that. <laughs> Doesn't make no sense. So all of us have to decide how are you going to fit into this game. Because the whole thing about the church is not how high you jump when you shout. It's how straight you walk when you hit the floor. Well. <laughs> You've got to be about business. And now, I ain't crazy. I love Jay-Z. I love music. But at the same time, I try to put things in perspective to what I need to represent to my community. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us have a responsibility for that. I probably went off on a tangent. No, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, so I want to open it up to uh, the crowd for some questions. Anyone have any? Then you want to ask a Brother Bill? Yes, sir. Uh, how you doing? Great, bro. My name is Marcus Black. Well, we already introduced ourselves. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay, Marcus. Um, Keep saying your name. It's impressions, impressions, impressions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, outside of the Bible, what are three books that changed your life? Oh, man. Hey, Malcolm. Malcolm. I'm going to write this down. Mal Malcolm X. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Wow. Without a doubt. <laughs> Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Damn, man. I got one for you. Talk to me. I, I told you I went to a Lord have mercy college. <laughs> this is called a community college. And I'm at a community college in 1961. I meet a black man who got a PhD in psychology from the University of Minnesota. Now, I don't stop and ask myself, what is a black man <laughs> with a PhD from Minnesota doing at a community college? His name was Dr. Albert Rogers. And he made me read the Negro Caravan book. Right. The Negro Caravan. Written first in 1941-42 by Brown and another brother from Hampton. Okay, who is that man? Well, come on up here. Come on, teach with me. Yeah, the Negro Caravan. The Negro Caravan. And, 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 um, oh man, that, oh boy, I'm getting, I'm getting happy. I'm getting excited. Um, now, third book, there's a lot of. You know, why do white boys have all the fun and stuff mm -hmm. like that? Uh, but I like reading about successful people. Mr. John H. Johnson. Mm -hmm. He is a man in Chicago, never been to college, by the way, That's right. and took his mother $500 with the furniture and got a loan mm -hmm. and built an empire, Johnson Publishing. Now, I'm not throwing no shade on his daughter, but if Mr. Johnson, now the publishing industry has changed dramatically. He know this. We own five newspapers. We hustle every day. But if Mr. Johnson was alive with 55 years old, he'd have found a way to save everything. Mm, right. Oh, yeah. He, he wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened, bro. Because you got something down here that nobody can teach. And one good example. Remember, the, some of y'all too young. But they usually have the Ebony Fashion Show. Right? Yeah. Lord have mercy. They come yeah. to the tour, you know, everything yeah. on the tour by two, you know. Right? <laughs> the gay people come out, everybody's in there. And they always had a charity that, they, that put it on, the charity got the money. Right. That was fake. Hmm. Mr. Johnson wanted the name, the address, the and the zip code for the subscription. <laughs> you got the trick black folks up there. You got to trick them. You got, you got nigger rigging. You know what I'm saying? You know? But that's the kind of creativity that God has given us. Oh, man. Oh, man. Same thing with a Barry Gordy. The same thing with anyone who's in this game and has been successful. There are some things that God has put in each one of us. Ain't, ain't, ain't no uniqueness in all these billionaires, you know? They got two arms and two legs like we have. But somewhere along the way, they focus on something more than anybody ever in the world. More than anybody ever in the world. And you got to just get into, zone into that and decide, oh, got one for you. Miles Monroe, mm -hmm. the Bahamian brother who was a preacher, mm -hmm. got killed in his plane accident. He went down in Freeport, Bahamas a few years ago. Miles Monroe has a book called uh, Pursuit of Purpose. Lord have mercy. What is my purpose on earth? Why did God let me live? What is it? I told you I wanted to be a social worker. That was my lifelong ambition. I've been a social I ain't stopped. Because I believe in people. I just told Boss. I just read a book by the, um, the education of, uh, what's his name, Boss? I just told you about it. I'll think of it. But the one thing this man says, you cannot teach a people 
whose culture you do not understand, mm. and that if you don't believe in their ability to succeed, you can't teach it. Where's that teaching? See, you can't do it. You can't send nobody here from, uh, hate to say this, from Africa to teach <laughs> little black kids if they don't understand the culture of here, the culture of this community. And Detroit is different from D.C. Mm -hmm. And Chicago yeah. is different from Atlanta. Right, right. you got to understand what makes these yeah. communities tick. Right. Mm. And that's something that, you know, we all got it, man. You can go to Houston, Texas, and you can see eight-year-old black kids in Houston. They're different from eight-year-old black kids in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Detroit has a saying, Detroit versus everybody else. Mm -hmm. Now, white folks just picked it up four or five years ago. <laughs> We've been sitting there for 50 years. <laughs> Detroit black people, for the good and the bad, said, hey, this is us, this is the way we do it, and if you don't like it, get out the way. Now, some of that's bad. Of yeah. so, some of that's bad because you chase away opportunity with white people who don't get it, you know. But some of that is healthy, that we have to understand that ain't nobody going to save us but us. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference between blacks in an Atlanta and a Houston and a Detroit. Because our culture, our experiences are different, you know? Now, I'm not being critical of any community, but you got to understand the uniqueness of those communities, you know? You said Mr. Johnson H. Johnson? John H. Johnson. The name of his book was... Uh, Succeeding Against the Odds. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank God you. bless you. But, man, that Malcolm X book got me straight because I was a young militant at that time. But I still like Malcolm. But this Miles Monroe book, what is your pursuit of purpose? Why did God let you live? What is in you? There ain't nobody else. I read that book maybe twice a year, trying wow. to figure out why. Wow. I, I'm being, I hate to say this, you know, I'm a social worker. Why did God permit me to do what I have done and accomplish what I've accomplished and have the money I have? Why? I wasn't the smartest guy in the, in the group by a long ways. I wasn't no Denzel Washington looking brother. Why? There's a reason. And I think that's why I do what I do. I think. I'm not sure. And if I'm wrong, he'll tell me. That, that's an incredible list. I'm, I'm, I think we're going to post that those books on a, on the a wife's website because those are incredible books. Um, that is, all of those books are, um, especially um, Why Do White Guys Have All the Fun. I've talked to a number of, um, of entrepreneurs that I look up to, and they talk about how that was one of the books mm -hmm. that really kind of shook them, like, mm -hmm. you know, went from kind of like a day ago, like, ah, I'm going to get there to the point where I need to step it up. This is, this is, this is, this is like, yeah. and, and everybody has a different way of going down this thing called, uh, that road called life, but I didn't marry Thomas 52, mm -hmm. and I, I was at Georgia State, boss, and, and about four years ago during the book, and a little white girl stood up and said, hey, uh, I, I read your resume and I listened to you, but when you first started out, when you first started out, what was your goal? It shocked me. And when I recovered, I said, well, that's, that's a really interesting point. Only child, good daddy, but he drank too much. I had one basic goal, to get my mama a house and Karina a house. It ain't my house. Them three black women had a home before I had one. Mm -hmm. All of them. That was my job. Wow. I didn't buy a home until I was 48. Decision. Didn't have a Cadillac either. That's a sacrifice. Yeah. There you go. Um, all right. Any other questions? Just one more. I had another. I'm going to let the rest okay. of the room have it real, real quick. You could, what do you say to the person who will say, it's too late? That comes up all the time. So I have a question for the group. Somebody says, it's too late to start in business. I'm too old. I ain't got no money. I'm colored. I'm black or one leg or whatever. <laughs> you know. Somebody tell me, how old was the colonel when he started Kentucky Fried Chicken? 68. Say it again, son. 68. And how, do you know how he got his first uh, uh, franchise, what he, where he got the money from to do his first demonstration? I do. He took his Social Security check mm. and wow. went to a gas station, bought a thing, 
and showed that gas station guy, if you put my chicken in your gas station, you're going to sell more gas. Right. He's 68. Wow. Ray Kroc, <laughs> so-called founder of McDonald's, so-called. So-called. Yeah. 58. Wow. Mm. It's never too late. It's never too late. This, 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 this will destroy you. The mind will destroy more business than failure. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. I can't do that. I don't want to try it. I won't be able to do it. Uh, what's going to happen? Oh, one black I'm going to lose my house. Well, hell, everybody lost a house a few years ago. <laughs> you know? Now, I don't, I'm not saying do stupid stuff. You know? But all of these things that we get hung up on, and, some, and sometimes you're going to fail. I talk about failure in my book. I went to a, a community college. It took me three years to get out of a community college. That's a two-year program. <laughs> First year, I got these classes called math, 091, uh -huh. English, 092, <laughs> uh, science, 094. I, I said, whoa, I'm a bad brother. Somebody said, those are remedial courses, man. <laughs> Don't mess up my dream, okay? <laughs> but I got my training wheels there. Ah. And I'm bragging. I had a PhD when I was 28. Wow. And the white man, no disrespect, Earl J. Mahoney told my mom and my daddy, you got a good kid, he ain't never been to jail, but he's not college material. Ah. And my mama said what your mama said. Just give him a chance. Just give him a chance. That 091, that 092 paid off, man. <laughs> So I don't accept, okay, I'm going to give you one of my quotes. And I normally do this when I go out, especially on colleges. Because, you know, I'm like your uncles who are my age, your grandfather's my age, every black man my age was told, you can't make it. <laughs> you know, you didn't have algebra, you didn't have calculus. And people, I say, well, why'd you take up social work? No chemistry, no biology, <laughs> no algebra. <laughs> no, but I got into black thing. I got into black thing very deep. But I always tell people, and I believe this with all everything in me. The brother that wants to fly, I believe this. Anybody from anywhere can accomplish anything if you put the work in. Say it again. Anybody from anywhere. Can accomplish anything if you put the work in. And what Drake says? Uh, Drake, Drake says. I saw the quote in here. Drake what says. Is, okay, good. Drake says, when you put the work in, when you put the work in, one day, one day. Oh shit! I've got the quote. One day your your idols will make your, your idols. idols will become your free rivals. Right. Hmm. One day your idol will become your friendly rival if you put the work in. I mean, we all been to college. You got to, well, I'm gonna sleep with my book under my pillow tonight. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pray tomorrow morning. You gotta pray, but you gotta put the work in. Yes. And yes, our community has always worked. We've always every black man I knew when I grew up. Everybody had two and three jobs. And about that is, what are you doing? To foster your economic independence. Example, I hate, to, I hate to say this, but you got a regular job where the government takes the W 2 and all this. Your hustle should be invisible money. Right. You know what I'm talking about. I ain't talking about no drugs now. I ain't talking about no drugs. <laughs> I'm not talking about drugs. But I am talking about the brother who's my barber. He said he worked at Ford Motor Company. He got laid off in 1977. He said, what can I do the rest of my life to make some money where the government don't take half of it? <laughs> he became a barber. <laughs> now, that's one man's decision, you know. Now, knowing me, I would have a regular job and a hustle. You know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, talent versus hustle. <laughs> in my opinion, <laughs> hustle will always be talent if talent doesn't hustle. Mm -hmm. The smartest guys I know are not the richest guys I know, uh. by a long shot. By a long shot, the smartest two black men I ever met in Detroit, one became a preacher, and one became a drunk. Intellectually gifted, one of them from Howard, by the way. Intellectually gifted, but could never put it all together 
because they were so smart they didn't have no common sense. Right? <laughs> so my hustling, I'll put myself up against anybody. Now, that plain thing got me tricky because, <laughs> because I really believe if, if you want to really fly, you can get there. Yeah. You can get there. But you got to put the work in, you got to be disciplined, <laughs> and you got to be willing to take a reasonable risk. Mm -hmm. And I'll take a reasonable risk any day of the week on myself. Mm -hmm. But that brother back there fly, I'm going to let him fly by himself. <laughs> <laughs> At least you can get those couple of hours underneath yeah. this man, right? Because a few hours, you good to go. Yes, ma'am. Tropical. <laughs> I like that idea, by the way. I like your business concept. There's a sister here in D.C. That has uh, oh, the, most, the most the most successful tropical. What's the name of the franchise? Tropical. 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 Yeah, she has the most successful one in the country. Yeah. She did. I was on a panel with her oh, up at Ward, black woman here in D.C. I don't know the location, but she had the most successful <laughs> tropical smoothie in America. Yeah. Younger? I would say she was like she might have been thirty-ish. Yes. Uh, she is a, a Capitol Heights. Okay. They have a doctor, and they have a great story because. Um, when we were looking, the location that we looked at, mm -hmm. the brand didn't like it because it was our demographic. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, that's not our demographic. Mm -hmm. We don't go into those neighborhoods with those household incomes, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. we said, okay, we'll pass. We're trying to follow the format and mm -hmm. go to a different mm -hmm. location. And then they opened. And in the second week, they went to the number one store in the country. And they've been there for two years. And now now they what ha it happened for the brand is mm -hmm. that they're traditionally – Black neighborhoods now. Mm -hmm. They're looking so like yeah. my second store is in a neighborhood that they never would have said I could mm -hmm. go into mm -hmm. four years ago. Prove them wrong. Again. So it, it, we mm -hmm. proved them wrong. Yeah. Uh, People told us not to open up a bookstore in Anacostia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Twenty plus years, not one bookstore, Anacostia. Right. On the other side of the river, I think there's between um, last I read, there's up to fifty different bookstores, independent and um, major. Um, brick and mortar bookstores mm. on the other side of the river. Not one over here for the past <clears throat> 20 plus years. Mm. They don't they don't understand and they don't know how to sell mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. Keyword. Mm -hmm. They don't understand how to do it. We're we're myself and another franchise owner are fighting with them right now because we were we both are pushing uh, Skyland. Mm -hmm. And they're saying the same thing over there, like, wait a minute, we've proven in four different locations that black people do it never this, stops that, right? and you still don't. <laughs> <It never stops. laughs> you don't want this And they don't understand that people, yeah. we, we look for the same services, the same it never resources. Stops. So if you put it, open it there, we want to go support <coughs> That's what we're looking for. It never stops. You need to understand that. It never stops. It never stops. Yes, so my ma question to you is, um, how do you evaluate, you know, like, a next move or a different idea because I feel like for me and my daughters right now we're kind of locked in with there's no more locations in the district for travel so that everything is sold out so we will only have two so we've been looking at different things to expand etc and I found that opportunities are there you can probably get more opportunities you can decide what to do with either from a capital or time or whatever so how do you think about those things and you know what resonates with you is okay this seems like yeah I can put some time and effort over here this one I'm gonna pass on how, how do you think about those well I, I, I don't know we could have a sidebar but I will tell you this my nose if you understand people people always say well how'd you go from McDonald's to automobile manufacturing how'd you go from that to casinos you know, I'm, I, how, how, do you, how do you do that? Well, first of all, in most businesses like now, <laughs> I've never been in a tropical, but I can tell you what your costs are. Your, your largest cost is what we call food costs, and your second is your labor. Yep, that's right. If you don't control those two, you might well go home and watch, let a housewife. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So it's not, it's not, there's no magic here. Mm. You know, there's no magic. But I hate to ask you this question. Now, I don't know nothing about this area, but I've heard, just told my boss, the highest per capita income for any blacks in America today mm. is Prince George County. Yep. Mm -hmm. What's over there? Because mm -hmm. yeah. you don't want to move. Because you don't want to go to Atlanta where all that money is. You don't want to go to Atlanta. You don't want to go to Atlanta, right? We're open to everywhere, but our stores are in Prince George's County. That's what I wanted to, oh, that's where you, okay, to bring services where yeah. I have. Mm -hmm. I grew up there, mm -hmm. went to high school, and Atlanta, moved away, and I'm like, we don't have services there. Right. So now I'm, if I come back, I'm going to I know you want to keep everybody in the desk. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you got to get off first base to steal second. Mm -hmm. I like that. And when you got money, 
you can go almost any way anytime you want to go. You ain't got women <laughs> no specials on no damn. What's that uh, airline? Crest. <laughs> Newman Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but, but look, but no, look, I tell, you, I tell you what I used to do a lot. I would just, I mean, everybody's crazy, you know. But I would just Google stuff. Well, there were no Google in those days. I just asked questions like, where is the wealthiest black community in America? Like in Detroit. I had a I had a restaurant that was the Detroit was in the ditch for years, but there was one community where blacks' medium income was higher than whites. Mm -hmm. Now white folks at the McDonald's, all their brilliance, they didn't know that, and I convinced them food to let me put a restaurant over there. I had the number one restaurant in Michigan for about six or seven years. <laughs> Study the money. And unfortunately, our community, if we make it, we're going to do what? Spend it. Yeah. That's another issue. Mm -hmm. sure. All right. We can get one more question in. So if you don't have it, I will. I'll take it. Um, so I would say, what do you say to, to somebody who's like, you know, looking at their student loans and you're like, I want, I, I, I want success. I want money i've only seen like getting my degree get a good job as like my reliable source for good income but especially when you don't have quite the dream of what to do next how to hustle mm -hmm. where to go you know how to get those additional incomes mm -hmm. what's considered a reasonable risk mm -hmm. what, what, what do you do what's the first what's that first step with well, like and this is going to lead me into my next book um, I'm a social worker. Okay. One of the richest guys in Detroit on the down low has an organization that does nothing but place foster children. That's his hustle. But he doesn't walk around with a Bentley and three Cadillacs every day. He keeps it on the down low. Mm -hmm. But he has a number one foster placement business. Now, they say agency, but I ain't no stupid fool. He is the number one business in the state for foster care services. Education. The most successful education people today are the people who have charter schools. Mm. I was dating this lady. She was very upset about Detroit Public Schools. So she got a job in Detroit with a pup with a charter school. So one day I said, hey, Sharon, I said, um, your school has security? Sure we have security. Well, who owns the security? I don't know. I'm a teacher. Okay. I said, who provides the food service? Don't, don't ask me. I'm a teacher. Don't ask me. I said, well, why don't you just ask around and see who owns those services for the charter school? The damn charter schools and mama-in-law were doing their food. His brother was doing the guard service. It's money. And we think it's education. Well, it is. Do it. You're going to do a good job with black kids. I ain't worried about that. But understand there's money being made by all these people. And if you plan it, you seek it out, if you talk to people who've been in that business, we can help you learn how to work it. Uh, one of the richest guys I know is a black man in Atlanta, Georgia. I won't call his name. Because you'd have a hard time Googling this brother. Mm -hmm. But he owned about 20 charter schools throughout America. Ooh, 20 of them. Now watch this. He built them. He worked them. Then he came to Lexi. You know what? You've done a great job for me for the last 16 years. I'm going to sell you the business. <laughs> and I'm going to make it very fair to you and your family. So we're going to work it out. But I'm going to keep the land in the building. You just pay me rent. Yeah, man. McDonald's. 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 <laughs> Come on now. Mm -hmm. We ain't got to reinvent this wheel many times. Mm -hmm. White folks right. have given us a blueprint. Right. So I would say to you, sister, now, let's take that student loan thing. I know some black people. One lady named uh, God, uh, uh, Bridget. Bridget <laughs> had more student loans than anybody ever met. This girl, she worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield. She got on some kind of trick that they would forgive some of your student loan for community service. Mm -hmm. And she went to the Church of God in Christ. She hooked it up with her pastor. And they might have lied a little bit that she was going to work so many hours a week at that church. And they began to reduce her student loan. There are ways that if you just pester it, pester it, pester it, pester it, 
there are ways that you can get it compromised a little bit. Now, that's not going to happen for everybody, but if you don't try, what the answer is? No. You don't get it. You know? Um, a friend of mine had a, um, what do you call it, a cell phone bill. I think it was $300. I said, girl, why don't you get that? What's that woman come on TV uh, on, the, on the public service? What's her name? Julie Norman, what's her name? White lady talking about uh, finance. Susie Orman. Susie Orman. Susie Orman. Yeah. I said, get the Susie Orman book and learn how to write a letter to your creditors mm -hmm. asking them to forgive a percentage of your loan. So I saw about a month later, I said, how'd it work out? You get 50%? She said, no, they wiped off everything. Mm. We just start hiding stuff, made like it didn't come, put it in the freezer, <laughs> think it's going to disappear. Bullshit. <laughs> Write letters. Find out, talk to people in this business. And uh, one of the, our challenges that we talked with Dean Boo, how are we going to convince 18, 19 year old young black people the new course that we're developing? The new book is entitled 100 Outstanding. Business success stories mm. for black people from 1850 to 1950. Wow. Mm -hmm. 1850 to 1950. Now, if you're in a sophomore and you're trying to get out of accounting three, what do you care about any black person that had a business in 1880? Why should that matter to you? Because here's what I believe. In my darkest moments, when there was no way out, I would say things like, hell, black folks been dodging a bullet a long mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. I got more sense than most people. I can fix this. I can do this. And I think it gives you a sense of pride and confidence to know that we've been here before. This is nothing new. We have everybody that go through, we 500 years, the Jews went through, well, be careful now. The Jewish community probably hasn't had 100 years of oppression like we did. Hitler did his thing, which was horrible, horrible, horrible. But it wasn't 500 years. We've been on this track 500 years. And we keep coming. Because we're strong. Your great great grandma has something in her girl. And you got a part of it. All you got to do is focus. Now, we'll say this. I gave him a quote in my book. Frederick Douglass said this. Without wealth, without wealth, there's no leisure time. Mm. Mm. Without leisure time, there's no time to think. Mm -hmm. We get so busy keeping up with busy stuff mm -hmm. that we don't have time to think. Some of my greatest business ideas have come when I just had to get away. Yeah. And me and God just have some good talks. Mm -hmm. And some of that has presented business opportunities to me that are out there already. But I had never focused on I had never grabbed them, you know. So student debt is real. But just start finding out how people get it compromised. Uh, I thought when you worked in a nonprofit setting that that would be one leg that you could argue about. But Bridget, I know this. I saw the letters. She was working, allegedly, 30 hours a week at her church volunteering. And they were deducted money off of her student, student loans. Now, maybe that was just a good person on a good day. But if you don't try, you ain't going to never get there. Now, can I take four minutes to talk about my new book? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, we're going to be at Howard tomorrow trying to convince black folks to take this class in January. Okay. Okay. I need your Holy Ghost. Thank you. <laughs> but here, here's my opening thing tomorrow morning. Um, you know, one thing we all learned growing up is that you don't mess with black folks' money. Mm -hmm. Big mama always said, don't mess with nobody's money now. Now, most of you are too young to understand and remember a gangster by the name of Pretty Boy Floyd. Right. Oh. But Pretty Boy, Pretty Boy Floyd was a bad white man. He robbed banks right. and trains all over America. In Oklahoma, there were about 30-some black towns. And the most successful one was Bowley, Oklahoma. So Pretty Boy Floyd and his boys said, you know what? They got a bank down there. Let's go get it. And allegedly, Pretty Boy Floyd said, wait a minute now, don't y'all go down there, them black folks. They all got shotguns, they all got rifles, they all hunt. Guy said, he's getting old. Let's go get him. The day comes, I think it was in October, November. They go to the bank. So easy prey, there's only two or three people in the bank. Hold up. 
Just give us the money. Nobody get hurt. This is Bowley, Oklahoma in 1927. One bank. The bank manager was named D.J. Turner. Mr. Turner was there and the bookkeeper was there. So don't pull the alarm. We're not going to hurt anybody. D.J. Turner pulls the alarm. He said, what did you do? He said, I pulled the alarm. Bam! He's dead. Kill the brother. The brother that had snuck into the safe had his rifle. He killed the guy that killed D.J. Turner. Mm -hmm. By this time, the town knows something because the alarm is going off. On that day, the pretty boy Floyd gang, all of them got killed. And black folks didn't lose a dime. Don't mess with black folks. <laughs> That's 1927. That's mm -hmm. bold. Now, why is that important today? Because, you know, all too often we think this brother took, this brother took a bullet. This is black folks' money that I've been entrusted with. The town had 4,000 people. It's 1927. 3,000 people came to his funeral. Wow. So it's these kinds of examples that we know nothing about. And the thing that amazes me about black folks is that, oh, Doc, we don't believe that, man. That didn't really help, Doc. You know, you're exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> okay. Here's a lady from Mississippi. Mississippi. Got no education. Ain't got no money. And don't look like Halle Berry. <laughs> but she said, I'm going to New York. I'm going to get rich. She goes to New York. She becomes a day worker. She saves up $5. <laughs> she buys a number 10 tub. Now, y'all too young to know what that is. <laughs> and a baby carriage. Some charcoal. She convinced the man that on the restaurant that her boy on the pig feet in his restaurant. And she got on the corner 123rd in Lenox. Yeah. And she started selling pig feet every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. She became known what was Pickfoot Mary. Her real name is Lillian Dean. You can Google it. I ain't lying. You can Google it, Lillian Dean. But the real beauty, beauty of her story is no education, no money. I'm giving black folks who just came here from Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, something they love, pig feet. Mm -hmm. Then she got in the Chitlin's hot bar. Now, I ain't talking about the dietary situation. I'm talking about what she did, okay? <laughs> but what is so amazing, she opened up the second one on 135th, and she did what God does. And she wound up in front of a drugstore owned by a man named Mr. Dean. Mm -hmm. And she and Mr. Dean got together, and they married. Yeah. Now, Pickford Mary could not read or write. Mr. Dean had a daughter who had been to Hampton. She trusted the stepdaughter. She became a multimillionaire in Harlem. Google now. You ain't going to believe me. You play white folks. <laughs> she, she, became, she became a multimillionaire in Harlem, and she moved to Burbank, California. And they estimate her state today would be worth $35 million. So what's my excuse? Lillian, Lillian Dean. So, so tomorrow I got to try to convince these students that if they sign up for this class, that they're going to hear stories about people who look like us, who walked this earth. They're not. This is only a hundred years ago, and we did it. No government loan, no SBA, no nothing but grit and God's grace, mm -hmm. and we did it. I'm trying to think of one more right quick, but uh, oh, I give you this one. Another woman. Now, we all know about Madam C.J. Walker, right? Right, right. Yeah. Okay, she's a bad sister. But she ain't a bad sister to help her. There's another sister named Annie Malone. Off the record, Madam C.J. Walker worked for her. She worked for Miss Malone. Miss Malone's store was in St. Louis, Missouri. She had her own washer and dryer. She had agents in Bahamas and Africa. Selling her hair products. She was bad. Madam C.J. Walker was one of her students. And a man named Chuck Berry. Now, who? <laughs> who did, some of y'all old folks remember Chuck Berry. How did Chuck Berry always wear his hair, brother? With a conk. Conk because he was a hairdresser. So she was big. So unfortunately, she fell in love 
Probably was a Kappa. I got a, I got a, I got a Q here and an Alpha here, so I can't put it up. She fell in love. She, her husband ran the business while she was out doing her thing. Yeah. And unfortunately, he filed for divorce. And in 1929, that's 1929, all the black women organizations came out to support me as in love. Please Google this stuff. I'm not making this up. And the court awarded him $400,000. And unfortunately, that destroyed her business, you know. You know, four hundred thousand dollars a lot of money. Still a lot of money to me. Mm -hmm. A lot of money in those days. So we're trying to convince students to sign up to take this course to hear about a hundred people who are who have done what we all want to do, but they did it at a time when there was no SBA. Okay. There was no friendly people around. But oftentimes like in Durham, North Carolina, they found one good white man, old man Duke like in Duke Tobacco and Duke University. He would help black people in Durham go into business. And that was one of the ways that North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company wow. was created. Mm -hmm. So these are stories that we want to bring life to. And I hope and pray that you will encourage people that you might know on campus to come out. Bro, you could benefit from this because you can sell the books. You know it. And, um, and so we're excited about it. Uh, the book will come out next uh, August of 2020. Uh, it's in the oven, it's baking, but I've been working on this 20 some years, and I'll tell you what God does. I was teaching at the University of Michigan, and some wh a white guy was there from Canada. He brought me a book called um, The History of Negro Business in America. He gave it to me by some white boy named Ingram. Ingram. So I read it, I started reading it, read it at night, late night. So one night, it's about 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm reading, I'm reading, and I come across the following story. There's a man named Horace L. King, K-I-N-G. He was born in South Carolina slave in 1819. His master was a uh, bridge builder. And for some reason, this young Negro kid just had a knack for building bridges. So in 1830-something, they moved to Birmingham, Alabama, because the South was beginning to rise with the steel mills and all that in Alabama. Long story short, they made lots of money. This black man made this family wealthy. They sent him to Oberlin College in Ohio for one year, and he came back to Birmingham, Alabama. They petitioned the Alabama State Legislature to make him a free man and they granted him his freedom. In 1841, he moved from Birmingham, Alabama, down to what is today called Phoenix, Alabama, with his wife and son, and started a business called King and Son Construction. This is before the Civil War. This is 1841. This brother's making money, he's doing good. Then the Civil War comes, and the South saying, hey, you got to help repair these bridges that the Yankees are blowing up. And the Yankees are saying, you got to tell us where these bridges are so we can blow up so he hides out. Literally, he hides out. So the war is over. He becomes a state representative for the state of Alabama. But he never goes to the meetings. He never goes to Montgomery to participate. But he's a state rep for two year, four years. 1871, he moves to a town called LaGrange, Georgia. And he develops a street for the colored community in LaGrange called King Street. I just started hollering. I wasn't married, so my wife wouldn't think I was dying. I just started hollering because I was born in LaGrange, Georgia at 213 King Street. So I called my mama the next day and I started asking her questions. Boy, you don't know nothing about the people. I was a little girl when I heard those stories. What are, you, what are you talking about? Where are you getting this from? Because she was born in 1921, and by that time the story was still running rampant about this family. He dies in 1882, but he is a Holy Ghost shout. He dies in 1882. He had two boys and one girl. One boy was named Thomas David King. They were very active in the Wesley, Wesley Methodist Church, which is in LaGrange. We were Baptists. 
we were poor people. We were <laughs> Methodists can read and write. We could. <laughs> but anyway, he winds up on Clark Atlanta College Board of Trustees. He served on that board from 1891 to 1927. Now, what happened in 1895 in America? Come on, y'all. Frederick Douglass died. Yeah, it might be true. I didn't know that. Well, something else happened in 1895. Atlanta Compromise. Come on, boy. Atlanta uh, Talk, Compromise. Atlanta Compromise. Yeah. Talk now. This is what I love about life. See, <laughs> there's always one. <laughs> yeah. So, so 1895 was when Booker T. Washington gave that speech in Atlanta about drop your bucket where you are. We can be as mutual as one hand but separate. So we don't need to integrate with you people. We're just gonna be carpenters and bricklayers and da 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 da. 1895. Now, he gave that speech at the opening day of that exposition. Now, why did the South have that exposition in 1895? Because the white business community wanted to show America and the world that the Negro problem had been solved. Slavery is over, and we all just going to sing Kumbaya and get along. So, Booker T. Washington gives his speech. Tremendous response. Very even even uh, Du Bois wrote him a note. What a great speech! That was on October thirteenth. On October thirty first, they owned the Negro Pavilion because they had a, had a World's Fair in eighteen ninety three in Chicago, and they didn't have no Negro place. No Negroes were in that. And Ida B. Wells wrote a strong letter about that. So now they have this Negro Pavilion which represented the future of our community. They had artists, they had students, they, it was the bomb. Guess who built it? King Son. King. King the Negroes at Clark don't even know he existed. Wow. Mm. wow. And they were, there's some books that would art. <coughs> what happened at the Negro Pavilion in 1895, today in Atlanta, it's called Piedmont Park. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Piedmont Park. And they would argue that that was the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance. Wow. Because the, the opening statue outside was a sculpture built by a man from Howard that said, The chains are broken. But he was implying we still have them on. Mm. That was that was the opening exhibit. <laughs> That's now. And so these things are just you you gotta understand this is not this is we've been here before. We've done everything. By the way, the winning bid for that uh exhibit, the building for the Negro exhibit, was nine thousand dollars or something. It was built by all black labor. Mm. It's beautiful. We have pictures of it tomorrow. It is beautiful. But Google it. Google 1895 Negro Exposition in Atlanta, Georgia. So, so, so our responsibility is to spread this message that we we have done all of this, and we just cannot sit by and may like we don't have the capacity to understand it and pass it on to our children, because I believe this makes all of us stronger. Mm -hmm. It makes all of us better when you know what your community has done. When there was no help from South Ohio, mm -hmm. you know, and um, Dean Booth, what about admitted, admitted about this book that I should have talked about? I think you covered uh, you covered quite a bit. Um, the only thing I would add about uh, Horace King, the state capitol in Alabama, he did a free form stairwell, and it's still there. Tell me what that means, Bob. It's, it's circular and it goes around, but there's no visible supports. No beams. Well, they decided that it needed repairing about 15 years ago. They couldn't figure out how to do it. So the, the repair actually had slats. That's now supporting it. <laughs> wow. A black man did. Had been there for over 100 years. Uh, we built a pyramid, so. And quite yeah. people, with all of their knowledge, all of the engineering, could not figure out how he created this. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Black power, brother. Okay, bro. God bless you. I'm sorry I took too long, man. No, 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 no. This is fantastic. Yeah, this, this, this was absolutely fantastic. Again, um, uh, 
on behalf of everyone, I think I can speak for everyone on this. Thank you so much uh, for for your insight and your wisdom. This is definitely um, well needed. Um, I'm excited that we were able to connect and. You saw me on TV, which I don't like doing at all. Yeah. So the fact that it even happened shows that Fine. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's supposed to happen because I can't stand being on TV. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so so thank you. Uh, and again, as I said before, this type of conversation um is is needed, and why these type of spaces is important because this kind of information, um, this each one, reach one, teach one is imperative because mm -hmm. when we leave from here we keep this information and we share it with the next person uh, we're going to open up for um, people to purchase books I encourage you to, to buy one I, and I never do this because I, I really don't like doing this but I encourage you to purchase purchase one as a gift and to give to someone because what we're looking to do is to build this black ecosystem especially in a place like this mm -hmm. where, we are in, where we are in southeast DC we see the gentrification coming yeah. but we keep complaining yeah. about it Stop complaining. Let's do something about it. We have all the skills. We have all the ideas. We have the innovation. We just have to invest in ourselves and each other. And then all that goes away. Just a very quick question, uh, mm -hmm. comment. And it's cliche, but the, the saying, lift as we ride. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I say that, it sounds like there's a lot of entrepreneurial people in here. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend Sean and I were just talking about the fact that um, you know, very often, we get to where we are, but we sort of don't look back at the, at the people who are just starting out. Yeah. And I saw this great post on Facebook, and I, I, I reposted it a couple weeks ago, and it said something to the fact, with small businesses, you um, people will uh, you know, buy Jay-Z's product. I don't know, I'm not a big you know, pop culture person, but you'll buy this product right. from all the well-known names you know, but we won't even like the small businesses Facebook page, which could help us grow. So, I mean, it, it's great to get the big names in there, mm -hmm. right, and to help them out and support. We will spend money on cars and sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, not, not me, but oh, as a community, yeah. right. we will. We will spend on all, you know, designer and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to just buying a book or liking a post that mm -hmm. doesn't cost anything, we don't do it. So I have to just put that out there to encourage since it sounds like it's a room of entrepreneurs, and I'm sure we're all going to go somewhere. So as we go, just um, you know, support each other. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I, 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 you know, I came a little late. I came from Woodbridge, Virginia. Hey, now. Whoa. Whoa. Thank you, girl. Whoa. But I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm so glad you also made that point as far as, uh, you know, we're so focused on putting the money in everyone else's pocket. Mm. The pockets, you know, the people who already have the money. Mm -hmm. But we really do have to invest back into ourselves. And so for me, my mission is to get to that next generation, like you talked about, because I'm a former special ed teacher. And um, we t I taught my students to, to write goals, <clears throat> to think about it, Think about what is it that you desire to achieve. What are, what are you interested in? What are your gifts and talents that, that you already you have already been given? And use those gifts and talents, or have some type of specialized knowledge to make your source of income. And mm -hmm. so you know, and and I'm, and it's it's very disappointing that they don't promote entrepreneurship enough within the schools. Mm -hmm. I know. I, I was teaching all those different subjects that I was one, I was a two, geometry, you know, um, biology, um, environmental science. I was teaching all of those things. But, but we were not teaching entrepreneurship, how to develop those skills that you already have. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's missing with our next generation, our children, you know, and, and so they're going to end up, right now, I mean, there, there's, the, there's a competition going on. You know, the competition between with the, the world and what we're trying, you know, us as entrepreneurial parents are trying to teach and, and instill into our children. And even as teachers, we're trying, I was trying to reach my students, but still I was competing against everything else that was influencing them. Can you come to Howard tomorrow morning and talk to them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd love to. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and um, and wrap this up. We did have a, and I want to make sure I respect uh, Doc's time and everything and everyone else who was here. But 
I'm gonna stay open. You know, if you want to uh, hang out for a little bit and kind of network and talk with people, again, ask some more questions of uh, Brother Bill up here. You know, we'll definitely be um, uh, open for a little while longer. Okay. So again, thank you all for coming out. We really highly appreciate it. And again, if you want to uh, get a book, uh, you purchase a book up front, and uh, Brother Bill will definitely be up front to uh, sign up. Yes, sir. I sure am. Thank you so much. I'm glad I came out.